Well, I can assure you that the worms enjoyed their lunch. And grace and peace to you from God, our creator, Jesus, our redeemer, and the Holy Spirit who sustains us. Amen. Today is Creation Care Sunday. Uh, this service is put together by the Environmental Justice Task Force of the North Carolina Synod. Um, and you all may not know this, but whenever I was halftime at CTK and halftime on the Synod staff as the Social Justice and Advocacy Ministries Coordinator, uh, my biggest accomplishment in that time was getting three task forces up and running in, in our North Carolina Synod related to different areas of justice, one for affordable housing, one for immigration, and one for environmental justice. And I chose to stay on the Environmental Justice Task Force even uh, when I became one of your pastors full time. And so as a task force, we decided that we wanted to create a service for congregations throughout the Synod to use and be able to worship together um, called a Creation Care Worship Service the Sunday before Earth Day. And so that's this Sunday because Earth Day is this Thursday, April 22nd. And we had a hard time discerning which scripture passages to use for this Sunday because there's so much in scripture about nature, about how God created us and our surroundings in God's own image, about how Jesus retreats into nature to pray, about how mountaintop experiences change the lives of prophets and disciples in our scriptures. There's so much there to explore. But we chose these readings about love from Mark 12, the greatest commandment, and from 1 Corinthians 13, often used as the wedding text. We wanted to talk about love of neighbor and how our neighbor extends beyond our human neighbor to our earthly neighbor, to the birds and the trees and the soil and the water that we need for life and that reminds us of our baptism. How our neighbor is not just the person next door, but we are connected to all of God's creation. I wanted to wax poetically about how beautiful creation is. It's one of my passions. I love being in nature. I love talking about nature, and I experience God most closely when I am in nature. I wanted to talk about how spring flowers give us hope and remind us of the Easter season that we are in, about how compost represents life coming out of our death and our waste about how aspen trees and mushrooms are communal organisms that create these incredible networks in the earth. And they are interconnected much like we are connected in the body of Christ. That's what I wanted to talk about today. But what I feel called to do is not that flowery and not that simple. Yes, it's hard for us to initially think of God's creation and God's green earth when we think of our neighbor it's hard for us to value the earth as a living organism rather than seeing it as an expendable resource only for human use. It's hard for us to slow down enough to notice the beauty of nature all around us, to notice all of the altars in the world. It's hard for us to care enough to change our habits and to hold corporations accountable for climate change. Yes, that's all true. But I felt like in order for us to come to the grand revelation that the earth is our neighbor too, don't we first have to realize that we've already, don't we first have to already make the connection that other humans are? And if we've made that connection already, why are we in the situation we are in? Why are we here today? Why are black and brown people still being killed? at the hands of those who are supposed to serve and protect. This week, Dante Wright and Adam Toledo. Why are people still separated from their families at our borders? Why are discriminatory laws about transgender youth being written right now in our North Carolina legislature? Why in all of these cases is dehumanization our go-to approach? Stripping our neighbor of their dignity, as if we somehow have the power to remove God's image from another human being or from the very earth that God created. Is that what love looks like? I don't think so. I don't think this is what it means to love God and love neighbor. In the greatest commandment, 
Jesus commands us to love God and to love our neighbor. He says the first commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus goes on to say there are no commandments greater than these, none. This seems pretty simple. It's a command. And there's nothing more important to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But then why are we struggling so much? Why do all of these issues persist? Why can we not see past our own household or our own neighborhood or our own skin color or our own gender identity when we think of neighbor? Jesus makes it pretty clear. He even goes out of his way to add the call to love neighbor. He's quoting the Jewish scriptures when he says love God. And traditionally in this commandment, Neighbor love is implied as well. So Jesus didn't have to add it here. It's implied in his tradition. But for Jesus, it can no longer be implied in our faith communities that we love our neighbor. He feels the need and the urgency to make what's implicit explicit. He feels the need to explicitly name his expectation of those who will follow him. Love God and love neighbor. Jesus knows he has to make this explicit because he knows what it's like to be human. He knows human nature. He knows the temptation to scarcity and the temptation to dehumanize our neighbor. He knows communities like the Corinthians will be divided and hostile. This is why Paul writes his famous poetry about love in 1 Corinthians 13, what Pastor Wolfgang read this morning. Paul is speaking to a community lacking love. A community so diverse and yet so fragmented by their differences. A community complicit at best in the face of oppression. And to this community, Paul writes about love. We know this passage well. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant, or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes on all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This passage is often read at weddings to name the love that's present in the room amongst family and between the couple getting married. But we know, based on the original Greek, that this is not a passage about romantic love or familial love. This is a passage about agape love, unconditional love. This is not a passage about love being present in the Christian, in the Corinthian community or in our networks of family and friends. This is a passage about the love that is lacking. It's a call to seek out the love we are missing. This is a call to action, a call to strive for radical communal love, for unconditional universal love, to strive to love our neighbors, all of them, in a way that honors their inherent dignity and worth as someone created in God's very own image. This is not a passage about Paul affirming the love of the Corinthian people or the love of a married couple. This is a passage about Paul calling a community of believers to create something new together, to imagine new possibilities about what justice-seeking love can look like. This is not a passage about comfortable, passive acts of love. This is a passage about a love that requires us to leave our comfort zones and to get a little creative. This is a love that necessitates our active involvement. Paul is writing to a community struggling with many of the things that we are facing in our world and our communities, and he is calling them to love. A radical, imaginative, uncomfortable, communal kind of love. Paul is clear here about what love is not. He says love is not irritable or resentful. Love does not insist on its own way. 
Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. In her commentary on this passage, Shively Smith says, Love does not hurt people. It does not damage the prospects of authentic community. It does not impede affirmation of another's humanity. Love does not impede affirmation of another's humanity. It does not strip people of their dignity and worth. Love does not rob transgender kids of their right to be exactly who they are as God created them in their image. Love does not separate families. Love does not dehumanize and kill people based on the color of their skin. Love does not exploit the earth and ignore climate change. Love does not insist on its own way of white supremacy and racism. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing and corporations cutting corners and polluting our waters all for a quick dollar and a profit. No, that is not love. Instead, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. The footnote in my study Bible said something that caught my eye as we prepare for Earth Day. It says that the Greek verb pipte, which is translated as ends, when Paul claims that love never ends, is actually used elsewhere in the Greek to refer to the wind. The use of this particular Greek word for end implies that love is like a wind that never subsides. Think about that for a minute, about the wind. Think about a time when you wish the wind would have just stopped. Maybe you were playing a sport and the wind kept knocking the ball off course. Or maybe you were hiking and the wind made the journey rougher and much colder. Maybe the howling wind kept you up at night wondering if a tree was going to fall on your house and if you and your family were safe. Think about the wind pressing against your body, resisting your every move. The strength behind a wind that will not subside. This is the force with which God loves us, all of us. Like a wind that without relenting keeps coming and coming. Like a wind that does not subside. Like a wind that never ends. A constant, unconditional, all-encompassing kind of love. This is the force with which God loves us. This is also the force with which we are called and commanded, for that matter, to love our neighbor, human and otherwise. Sometimes the wind is at our backs, and sometimes we must push through the headwinds of discomfort. Sometimes the wind knocks us off our feet, and sometimes it gently cools us down when the summer heat is too much. Sometimes the wind is comforting and calming, and sometimes it reminds us of the power and intensity of the natural world. Sometimes the wind reminds us of God's presence with us in the Holy Spirit and brings chills to our arms. The wind is constant. Though it may dwindle at times, it is always around. The wind never ends like God's love for us and for our neighbor. We are engulfed in and called to this reckless kind of love. We are created in and called to see the image of God all around us. God's love never ends, it never fails, it never subsides. It is a reckless love that invites us to another way, to new life, to be loved and to share love. Amen.